180 degree difference. Uh, we would like to uh, invite up uh, the person we're very on we are honored to have a number of Stonewall veterans, original members of the Gay Liberation Front here with us. Uh, am I going in and yeah. out? But Carla J, uh, world-renowned author and activist, is here to take us back a few years. Jay, have you got a working microphone? Yeah, let me see. Let's get this one. Okay. Carla? Come on. I hope I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. If you can't, don't raise your hand. I can't see. <laughs> don't bother. <laughs> First of all, I'm here with my brothers and sisters from the original Gay Liberation Front. Let me introduce them: uh, Michaela Griffo, um, Mark Horn, Eric Bass, and uh, Kathy Wakeham. I don't know if anybody else is here. Uh, if you are, um, you know. Um, Today, ironically, today, July 31st, is the 49th anniversary of the decision of the Gay Liberation Front to form an organization um, that began to meet regularly in the wake of the Stonewall uprisings. Not in the wake of the Stonewall Bar, in the wake of uprisings that lasted for a week. Um, we decided to get together and form an organization that would, what today would be called intersexuality. We worked with groups like the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, the Vince Rainbows Brigade, Women's Liberation, and many other organizations. We started women's and men's dances. We studied theory and we decided the most important thing of all, we created this march. We did, yes, we created this. It is not the Stonewall event that was anything. If we did not commemorate this uprising with a march every year, it would have just been another event in history. So what we did was, in November of 1969, some of our members went to Philadelphia and we decided to have a commemoration the following June, which we called the Christopher Street Liberation Day March. We didn't even mention Stonewall. Some people called it a Gay Pride March. The people you see here, we risked our lives to bring you a march. We went into bars, we were thrown out, we were threatened. We walked in Albany in March of 1970, they threw things at us. There were no floats. We organized this march so that people would be free, so that we would have a community that could gather together to get other people to come out and be free. We wanted people to be out in the daylight not to be in the bars, to come off the sidewalks and join us. Not for people to be us and them, like a Macy's Day parade, where you are either a marcher or you are a float. We want people to come off the sidewalks and feel like they can join a movement. We want people to be part of us. This is what we tried to create. And we did for many, many years. You. The people who are here, you are the people who are our true heirs. You really are. You're the people of the future for whom we created this march. We did not create this march for Citibank. We created it for you, for people like you, and for our allies. It's for LGBT people to go out and to claim our lives to ask for the world to give us our rights, no matter who we are and how we want to live. We did not want marriage. We wanted to create a different kind of world in which people would be equal whether you want to get married or not. Yeah. 
We're not giving you the torch. We're still hanging on to our torches. We're creeping along as best we can, but we want you to get a torch. We want you to light it as best you can, because we know that the people in this room, I know that all of you can do better than what's been done. And I think that next year, which is the 50th anniversary, that you are going to create a march that is not going to be Disney on concrete, that this is going to be some kind of march, not a parade, that is going to make all of us proud. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carla, and thank you all. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, next year is not only the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, it is also going to be World Pride in New York. The organizers of World Pride, which is awarded every few years to different cities, first to Rome to challenge the Vatican, uh, to Jerusalem to challenge uh, bigotry and exclusion there. Uh, and now it is coming to New York next year to honor the Stonewall Uprising and acknowledge the 50th anniversary. But what that means is that people from all over the world will come here, and people from all over the world are facing uh, uh, torture, death, uh, discrimination in ways that uh, certainly still exist in this country, but to uh, just lost it. Much greater degree in places around the world. So we want to highlight those international issues, and Leosha of Rusa LGBT is here to talk a little about what's going on around the world. Hello, hello. Today, actually, four-year anniversary since I moved to the United States. Exactly this day, four years ago, I moved from Russia. Not moved from persecution and actually I'm standing right uh, in front of you and my stonewall is ongoing because now we are in fight with Russian speaking community here for the last three days I've been threatened to death so some mafia is after me because we started um, uh, like uh, digging up into the Russian speaking community because it's very homophobic and now we are facing real threats from our compatriots because we uh, try to protect our community and we were contradicting some racist remarks making by Jewish people against African Americans. That's why they started threatening me. And we've been, Rus LGBT has been uh, building up a lot of relations within different organizations across the world. And now we're working closer with Netherlands, Belgium, France, and uh, Germany with people from Chechnya who escaped genocide last year. And it's still a uh, not well known topic. And of course, uh, Heritage of Pride doesn't give a shit about that. And if you see the video, it's, it, it reminds me like Soviet Politburo Gateway, you know? <laughs> so, and actually, what I would like to highlight, for example, in different countries like Netherlands, Belgium, and France, there is prides. But it's not prides, it parades. But nobody welcomes immigrants there, asylum seekers, because you know the number one problem is refugee camps. What is refugee camps? And people live together side by side, LGBTQ and others, and all LGBTQ mostly will be beaten up or persecuted uh, against their identity in these refugee camps. And governments in those countries do not uh, bring up that topic, actually. And pride parades, if you look at this, for example, now it's uh, August 4th, it's going to be Netherlands. Let's see how it goes. But the issue is not solved. So we have to address those issues with, because people uh, who fly away from their countries and they put uh, settling down in refugee camps, they still facing discrimination against, and government but doesn't do anything. I'm not mentioning our government here, because now, uh, if you read the last article, uh, Russian government and the United States government made a deal about asylum seekers. So, and now Russian government can claim those people who filed for asylum, for example, but they uh, still have legal status. So, and uh, those uh, couple occasions that people will be withdrawn from asylum and uh, got back to Russia, because it's a failure by the American
American government. So immigration process is very um, disturbing right now. So this is uh, my main concern because we want to bring people here, but like a couple weeks ago, uh, Chechen guy was refused, was denied with asylum because a lack of evidence. I don't know what lack of evidence if people die in there every single day and still ongoing process. So internationally speaking, we are holding right now different protests across the different um, states and different countries to highlight those issues. And of course, of course, Rus LGBT uh, has a lot of people from all over post-Soviet republics, all 12 republics. And you know that now, I never, when I try to talk to uh, Heritage of Pride, they told me that, of course, we support immigration. But I haven't seen anything, any actions to take uh, towards this topic, because we know that a lot of issues we should raise right now especially detention centers here. A couple of our transgender people were detained and were humiliated by the American government. Uh, people who travel for, to Canada, for example, the asylum seekers, it's very, uh, ICE operates very uh, ferociously right now. So, and of course, for us, Stonewall and 50 year anniversary, we need to claim our freedom, but we have to unfortunately fight for freedom here still, because it doesn't apply to us to immigrants, and especially uh, if you know uh, this Muslim ban affects not only people from those six countries, but from all uh, republics, for example, of Russia, and for gay people who are from Ingushetia, Dagestan, Chechnya, they still consider Muslim. That's why uh, American government doesn't take them. So this is what we would like to raise, and that's why we launched Brighton Beach Pride as well. And for us, uh, Brighton Beach Pride, as, as long as I... Thank you. <laughs> And I pro as long as I live, it's not going to be commercial at all because Russians don't like to give money, but <laughs> we don't like to take those money. That's why I invite you because I, it's definitely going to be some kind of a 50 years anniversary and three years anniversary of Brighton Beach Pride. And we need to raise those international issues because we have some people who are in some kind of decline and denial and uh, danger uh, in some secret facilities, but we would like to bring them here, but as long as Trump's administration does not allow us, so we cannot save them. That's why we're trying to build the global awareness between, with voices for a group, like uh, ACT UP group here, uh, to bring those attentions to the American media, because unfortunately, American media is not so good in terms of propaganda. Yeah. That's why I uh, urge you to step uh, forward and to support immigration issues, because it's, I guess, across the uh, spectrum, it's very important right now, because certain people People. For example, Nor Norway refuses with asylum. Uh, even people were beaten up to death, almost. So they don't uh, take asylum seekers. France do uh, doesn't take asylum seekers. Netherlands, only if you were politically act active, in, for example, in Russia or Ukraine, not all people. And only, un uh, unfortunately, the United States only takes those people, but they cannot enter the country. So that's why we have to raise that question and bring it to the table. And I know personally, I don't know what's going to happen next year with 50 years anniversary and with uh, hope, because they're not so um, helpful at all in this issue. So let's get together. Thank you. A vast understatement. Okay, and uh, now we're going to hear uh, from uh, someone who really spearheaded uh, the Reclaim Pride uh, Coalition. Uh, my friend Natalie James. Uh, thank you, thank you, Karen. Thank you to Anne. I can't imagine oh. two. Uh, Hold on a little bit closer. There we go. Hello? Hello? Yeah. This one may work for the Hello? Yes, uh, I can't imagine two more amazing uh, facilitators. So first of all, round of applause for them. Ooh. I'm so honored that, that they are leading this discussion. And I've been so honored to be part of this, this movement. Um, I uh, sat down uh, in, a, in a caffeine craze state one morning and wrote out a, a bunch of demands based on some meetings that a bunch of concerned people had had. Uh, and uh, these, meet, these, uh, these demands were edited by a, a, a legendary activist, Leslie Kagan, which was an honor. Uh, and she's been an integral part of this movement, uh, or this, this, uh, this effort moving, uh, moving up to this point. Um, we had uh, an uh, incredible experience uh, delivering these demands to, to Pride, but we knew that this was not the, the, in any way the end point of what we were working towards. 
ever since the very beginning of when we started meeting as a group, we knew about Stonewall 50. That's always been the underlying theme. And I'm so happy to have all of you here. And I want to have an even larger group of people here. I, for me, I, I think that, that, that pride must be political. I've had, I had an, uh, a very inspiring experience of flying down to Orlando, and, uh, which is my hometown, and, um, and, and helping to, um, to, to found um, Gays Against Guns Orlando. And this, this, was, this, was not, this was not so long after Pulse. And, and these, this was a community that was writhing with, with angst from, from Pulse, from, from Trump being elected, and to see signs that said, you know, Trump is not my president, you know, it was, it was amazing. And I hope we can do something like that together. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, let me set the scene first, for, set the scene for a minute. So Heritage of Pride, works very hard, puts on a major event, but they are totally, totally swept up in the uh, what they see as the great success of bringing these corporations into this event. Uh, we had a meeting with them, and uh, the guy who's running that part of the operation said, uh, you know, they're not in this to make money. <laughs> We presented them with a vision of a major civil rights march. Uh, to forget about the corporations, to have a major civil rights march. Those of us who remember Stonewall 25, remember the, uh, you know, we had a big fight with the city then because uh, they didn't want us to have a big march in the middle of the city. They actually suggested we march in Queens or the Bronx or something. Uh, all, fine places, all of them. But uh, <laughs> I go there often. But, uh, but they ended up uh, mandating a big march up First, a up First Avenue into Central Park big stage and rally, uh, and uh, Gilbert Baker's mile-long uh, rainbow flag being carried up First Avenue. Many of us who th were angry at the city for mandating First Avenue took Fifth Avenue on our own, thousands of people marching up Fifth Avenue. And we all met in Central Park and had a big rally, tens of thousands of people, speakers, performers, whatever, big stage. So that is the vision that some of us have for this. Uh, Heritage of Pride, this was a whole new idea to them, because uh, most of them are not old enough to remember that. Uh, and because they are, they are in the mode and the mindset of doing the uh, corporate uh, Mardi Gras parade. And in speaking to them and to some of the political offices, what we keep hearing is people want different things. It's a diverse community. And uh, this strikes me as all wrong, but uh, that is why we need to figure out what we do want to build community support for it and to do what we want to do, whether it is sanctioned or not. Uh, but that's where things stand. Uh, there are some who would like to, who think the great compromise is to do the corporate march on Sunday and do this, you know, civil rights march on Saturday. Exactly, you're so far ahead of us. So uh, that doesn't strike us as the correct solution. So these are the issues sitting out there. I say that just so you know we can shortcut this a little and and talk about what the real issues that are going on. Uh, also, I would like to assert another issue, which is that we have to pay a lot of rent for this room. Now, that's another conversation we ought to have with the center. But meanwhile, we are paying rent, and we have to pay $400 for the use of this room. Perhaps T-Mobile would like to pay that. <laughs> But they haven't stepped forward yet. So uh, we're going to pass a couple of uh, little beige bags and ask you to kick in, please. 
All right, so the floor is now open oh. for dis... Yes, there's Jay. One, there's one other aspect of, of the Reclaim Pride Coalition that I just want to bring up so, Please. So, so that it's you know in folks' minds. Um, and that is uh, that another one of our big issues was the over-policing and over-barricading of Pride and of the West Village and of the city in general. Um, I, you know, in my 33 years of living in New York, I have seen what's gone from a, 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 a march that anyone could join at any point when they saw a group going by. Oh, look, it's gay authors. I work in a bookstore. I'll go join and march with them or whatever you wanted to do. You could, you could have access. What we've seen over the last 25 years really is the march becoming more and more closed off that the march that the march becomes completely separate from the observers instead of it being a full community event and we've also seen the the uh, increased uh, use of the uh, the French metal bike rack barricades that interlock, that cut people off, that cut sidewalks off, that make people have to walk three blocks out of their way just across the street. Um, and what we've, what what all of that has be, has 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 become a symbol of is is the fact that there's been this sort of capitulation by Heritage of Pride to kind of the powers that be in New York. And all of this stuff started during Giuliani. And what happens whenever you give an inch, whenever you give an inch to any kind of power, any kind of power, it never recedes. You know, Giuliani went out of office and got Bloomberg, who wasn't anywhere nearly as horrible as Giuliani, but all of that Oh, policing, we could debate that. Uh, well, <laughs> good point, good point, but in some way. <laughs> but none of that, none of that, that over-policing, none of that over-barricading receded. So I just want to throw that out there as well. And I would like to point out that we've had two major women's marches since the election of Trump that have managed to go through the streets with hundreds of thousands of people uh, quite peacefully and successfully. All right, so uh, the floor is open for discussion. We're gonna hold people to 90 seconds uh, in their speech. You can always speak again after other people have had a chance to speak, but we'd like to hear your thoughts, ideas, comments. Whatever. Uh, so we're going to ask for folks if you um, if you are able to. We'd like for folks to line up along this. Along no, line. let's just call on them. Yeah, I hate the lining up. <laughs> yeah. You have 90 seconds. I will do this, which will mean you have 30 seconds, and then I'll come over. And no, I'm joking. But you have 90 seconds because I know a lot of people are going to want to speak. Okay. Right, so I'll do this and let me do 30 seconds. All right. Maxine. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Maxine Wolf. Um, I'm one of the founders of the Dyke March. Yeah. And, um, and Marlene Colburn, stand up Marlene, uh, is another founder of the Dyke March. Yeah. So we have a lot of experience of creating marches that are in the spirit of, of the original gay liberation marches. Um, and we did it because there was no visibility for women and for dykes in the LGBT march. So I'm hoping that whatever protest we make has that visibility because otherwise dykes are not gonna come to it. You can bet your life on it. Okay. And I also wanna say that 90 seconds is like the barricades. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. Okay. So I've been going to gay pride marches both alone and with ACT UP, the Lesbian History Archives, the Irish Lesbian and Gay Organization, and many other organizations that I've been part of. And part of that was being able to walk up and down the street and go from one to the other. Until about 20 years ago, when the Heritage of Pride Marshal started asking me where I was going. Okay, and I said, I'm on a city street and I'm going to where I wanna go. No, you have to be with a group, that's when that started. So, you know, it's been going on for many, many, many years and I think we should protest it, but not on Saturday night, no. okay? You cannot take away the dike march. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you plan to take away the dike march, we will protest you. We will win, okay? Because we will be very adamant. 
I want to say one other thing. Stonewall 25, we had an international dyke march, okay? Because it was Stonewall 25, and people came from all over the world. So we're going to do that again this year. It's going to be the third one, because the second one was in Dublin. And in case you don't know, there are dyke marches held all over the world, from South Africa to Mexico to the Netherlands to you name it, it's there. So we want to make sure that it's an international dyke march. Yeah. I just want to make a... I want to make a very quick announcement, uh, just that we do have an ASL interpreter here with us in the room. If there's anybody here who, who, needs, who needs those services, please let us know, and she can begin. She's just on standby until we see someone that, that needs the service. We can take turns calling on people. You go ahead. Someone there, maybe ASL? Hi, my name is Mark Horn, and I'm here with the Gay Liberation Front group, and I will, I will speak very quickly. Um, we've all uh, spoken among ourselves and on lift serves because we're all over the world now. Uh, and I just wanted to speak to some of the points here to let you know kind of where we're coming out. Um, although, of course, like this room, a lot of us disagree with each other. And we're very respectful about it. Um, so, uh, in terms of neutralizing the resistance, this was a civil rights protest. That's how it started. That's what it should be. All of the community organizations should be up front first uh, with regards to corporations. Um, well, that, that we, there's a degree to which that ship has sailed. However, um, we look at uh, something like uh, gay rodeos, um, all of the other events, there are corporate sponsors. They don't have floats, they have banners. They are sponsors and they pay for sponsorship. So that's, we think that that's where they belong. They don't, shouldn't have 800 people when community groups can't get their people in. Um, as, as uh, in terms of the uh, over barricading, our original cry was out of the closets and into the streets, off of the sidelines and into the streets. Uh, we understand that there are issues of terrorism, but we want people to feel free to join us. Certainly, I ran back and forth between gay youth and the Gay Liberation Front and a number of other groups during those years, and I think I'm kind of out of time, and because I'm a big believer in boundaries, I yield my time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Ashkenazi. Um, those who don't know me and knows I go way back. I, I joined the movement. Ju I just missed the first March in 70 by a few months. Um, became involved in the Gay Access Alliance. Been involved in a lot of organizations, including the founding board of the center. I started the Harvey Milk High School, opened the first um, shelter for homeless LGBT youth, um, long list. I don't know why we keep shooting ourselves in the foot and, and protesting against ourselves when there's, this country is falling apart. Um, there are some things that I really agree with you about. The barricades suck. The wristbands is a terrible idea. Uh, we should be able to march. But this is no longer a civil rights march. It is a celebration. We should celebrate how far we have come. Um, I think the corporate sponsors should not overpower the rest of the parade. Uh, they certainly shouldn't get more rights and have larger contingents than, than the community groups. But I can remember the time, and I know people here in this room can remember the time, when people could not be out at work. I think it is fabulous that people organize within their organizations, within their um, workplaces, to bring their corporations out to march with us and to celebrate. We have a lot to celebrate, and, and this is the day that we should be celebrating. I also know that HOP, which organizes the march, is an open organization. If people have ideas and want to change things, they will welcome you to come and be part of the group. And absolutely, I know people who do it. I, I've never been part of the group, but I know people who are on it. Um, go and talk to them. But this is a day of celebration. Hi, I'm Jack Waters, um, and I want to point out um, 
that one of the most, um, the strongest um, issues of stratification uh, that comes hand in hand with the corporatization of the um, march is the separation of LGBTQ youth of color, which is specifically and particularly con congregated or has congregated around the area of peers. Um, like the former or like the previous generations of, um, of queer people, um, the peers, particularly around Christopher Street, were a gathering place that are, is now obstructed by the barricades. And in this interest of combining a celebration with a protest, which I don't really see as being oppositional, but in fact very much part of it, is bringing the celebration to the post parade um, by removing the barricades from the piers and restoring the drum circles that used to happen post parade, which was a great com like amalgamation. It joined really. Um, queer youth with elders, um, and I think would be a fabulous way of galvanizing community by just removing the barricades from the Christopher Street Piers. Hi, I'm, um, um, I can project. I, it was working. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Barbara Kahn. Um, my first march was in 1979. My last time marching was at least 10 years ago because of um, not just the length, because when I marched, it was uh, almost as long but it wasn't as strenuous being behind the loud music, those endless floats that take forever, uh, so that stopping and starting, especially as we age, becomes difficult. Um, but I also remember the 25th anniversary and how personal that was, even though it was worldwide. And the organizers wrangled some of us to go to JFK and meet people coming from around the world, escorting them here to the city, especially if they had not ever been here before. I brought uh, two young people from South Africa, from JFK to Manhattan. One was a young man who was terrified. He had never been out of his rural village before, and he was overwhelmed with Manhattan. Three days later, I saw him in the company of some very nice looking young men. <laughs> um, but anyway, I mean, there are things like that that we can do so that even though we're big in numbers, we can still be personal. And I also want to say to the Russian gentleman, I'm the daughter of a child refugee from war in Russia, and it breaks my heart to see what's happening around the world and also in this country with the children. And um, my siblings and I always differentiate between refugees and immigrants and migrants. They are not migrants, they are people running for their lives. Thank you. Hi folks, my name is Paul and I help run a group uh, here at the center called By Request. Uh, we've been marching for some years carrying a banner for um, Brenda Howard, who we know as a bisexual person and the mother of pride, she calls herself, or called herself, she's passed away now. Um, I did want to make one point about uh, the value of employee resource groups that are very important within corporate structures to, to bring people who are LGBT into a circle where they can have some safety. And I know that that has been co-opted, like lots of things have been co-opted in the march that, that's happened right now. But um, as we think about excluding corporations, we should also think about ways in which we can include employee resource groups in some way that, that they give a face to you know, being able to work regardless of your orientation. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Milano <laughs> with Rise and Resist. I want to talk about um, uh, my vision for World Pride, and I hope everybody here can talk about it. Let's not now, let's stop complaining. Let's talk about what we want a next year to be, right? So in terms of lobbying for these, 
Uh, my vision for next year is number one, right? Replace the hop march with a protest march. Um, let's not say we can't do that, whatever. Let's see what our vision is. And my vision is that we get rid of that fucking march, that parade, and replace it with a protest march. So, right? So, and it was done in LA two years ago, right? So we can do it too. Uh, my, my second alternative to that would be to start with 50,000 people doing a protest march, and then the corporations can march after that, right? I have no problem with employee groups marching behind a banner. I have a problem with huge floats that clearly are nothing but marketing opportunities, right? That's all they are. So if, if Citibank employees want to march behind a Citibank banner saying Citibank employees, I'm cool with that, right? But get rid of the goddamn floats that slow everybody down and that make the, the march last nine hours, right? So first choice, replace the thing. Second thing I would accept is a march on the same uh, day in front of it. That's it. If we don't get that, then we disrupt, right? We do what we did 25 years ago with no barricades, no permit, nothing. We just put 5,000 people at Stonewall and marched. So I say we go for one of those three options and please vote for one of these, right? Don't, don't box ourselves in and say, oh, hop is too strong, we can't do that. We are stronger than hop, right? Yeah. We will be stronger than hop and we will take this damn thing back. Thank you. was saying it's a day for pride. It's also a day for work, too, because we have to do a lot of outreach that time. It's the only opportunity we have. And I've gone to Heritage of Pride for back in the 90s and the 2000s, saying that you have booths to outreach the people, but there's no way to get to them, because small groups like Oxios, I represent uh, an Eastern Orthodox gay LGBT group, and other small organizations can't afford the booths and uh, they have corporate organizations that have big flows that they can downsize it and use that money to help um, help pay for booths at these um, outreach things because gay pr uh, pride is out. Uh, you know what I'm saying is it's not a day of pride, but it's a day of work because I never gotten so exhausted for gay pride <laughs> doing outreach by setting up a table one year, and I almost I got the police sucked, sucked on me because I had a little card table to ask for. Um, well, you know, to put out literature for small organizations. So an organization, small groups like ours, is not going to get any work done at all. And it's not a fun organization because we have to do outreach, and this is the only opportunity we do. And if the organiz uh, prior, uh, corporate organizations want to do all this uh, promotion, they can at least help small organizations get to have little tables and stuff. Because the only time we're going to do outreach, this is a civil rights march. It's a civil rights opportunity to uh, outreach to people. The small groups, not just big fucking organizations like GMHC who has lots of money and, and small organizations have to almost get, uh, we almost get arrested for having a little booth out there by Heritage of Pride, sick and cops. The cops are more polite to me than the uh, the sick, uh, the Heritage of Pride person. So I've gone to the meetings, the Heritage of Pride, and they don't change. You ask them to help, they don't understand. But they eventually give you a break when you say you can't afford the march on uh, the Pride. But for Booth, forget about it. They give it to money, they give money to churches like MCC, which has money to pay for Booth, but small organizations, they don't give, they fucking ignore them. I've been doing this for like 20 years, and I've been with our, with our organization for 35 years. And we've never gotten so much of mental, psychological abuse by organizations not giving a shit. And this is 
heritage of pride. Uh, Her uh, Sizzle Dick originally was more sympathetic to small groups than heritage of pride, I'm sorry to say, even though they're a mob-run organization. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Margaret, and I am part of By Request, and I also marched with the New York Area Bisexual Network this year. Um, it was actually my first time marching, and I want to take a moment to just put it into perspective that, you know, as most likely one of the youngest, if not the youngest person in this room, you know, I and many other people my age, my generation, we've had a very different experience of growing up, whether we knew that we were LGBT from a young age or not, even whether we were straight or not. Um, it's a very different thing. Um, and I think those of you who have been fighting the fight for a long time, you have a lot to be proud of. And, you know, also that in a day like today, um, you know, one of the things that we have to turn our attention to is the more subtle issues, like what, like the corporations, is it lip service or not? And why there are so many people who think we have Hi. rights. Literally mid-sentence. Um, when it comes to all social justice issues, not just ours, all of them, I firmly believe that we're in an age of combating the more subtle um, issues. And also, we've come a long way for it to look good for corporations to be marching. If you want to be with us, that's super cool. <laughs> like, that, I mean, yeah. here's Lou, so we need to turn our attention to the small things, make sure that people don't forget that we still need to protest because making sure that we know that, that this younger generation knows that, you know, like that has much long, farther reaching implications than just next year, than just one event, than even Pride Month itself. Thank you. My, my name is Scott Kaplan. I'm the police misconduct and corruption officer of the Jim Owls Liberal Democratic Club, one of the two citywide LGBT political clubs. We march every year except this year when we boycotted the march and I marched with uh, Rise and Resist. Fundamentally, I think we have to tell Mayor de Blasio, who seems to be afraid of the police, who largely don't even live here, that we need to take back control of this march from the police. Their only role should be protecting us from real and potential acts of violence against us. They they should not be dictating anything. The streets should be open, the barricades should be removed, and the march should end at a place where people can be free to gather. So if it's at the piers, the piers should be open. The police too often are afraid of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Hi, I'm Sandrine Blake with Amita Care Health Insurance, and this was our third year in the March, and it was a very different year for us. Um, we are a small non-for-profit health insurance plan, and we marched off at 7 o'clock at night, and by the time we got past 14th Street, I felt like I jogged to the end of the march, and it was over, and that was it, and you go home. And I immediately went back to our office, and I called a meeting to discuss it, every step from back-end planning to sponsorship, donation. Where's our money going? Yeah. What are we putting it towards? I thought of the first thing was a call at the beginning of 2019 to all of our affiliates, our community-based organizations that we work with, um, some of the organizations we sponsor as well, just to say, let's join together, let's band together to try to march in 2019, to make a larger presence, to show that there is communities. We invited our membership and to sit out there with people who might have afflictions and you know health conditions and sit on the street on for hours just waiting in, in hopes to march off, it was really hurtful. Yeah. And I just couldn't sit back and think, this is what I wanna do for next year. So when I got the invite to this meeting, I said, yes, let's, you know, let's go. I wanna go and bring back information to my company to say, this is what we can do next year. But also, I, I just wanna call to, are we getting into these corporations? Are we finding out who organized it for T-Mobile or for the banks? to say, hey, do you know what's really happening? Do you know where it started? Do you know what the march is really about? And what's your organization doing to our community? What are they putting back into our community in other ways? They can take that sponsorship money and bring it to a ton of organizations here. Yeah. All right, uh, Jay? Yeah, maybe get some of these folks in the front there. Yeah, as you can see, there are a lot of people who want to talk, so uh, everyone's being wonderfully eloquent, but let's give everyone a chance. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Terry Ferreira. I'm one of the organizers of the New York City Dyke March, uh, and I'm here with some other committee members and um, other people who founded the Dyke March. And I want to just mirror what Maxine said earlier that um, you know we fully support the Speak up. we fully support the Heritage of Pride March becoming um, like a civil rights march, actually in the ways that it had been at the beginning. However, if it's a compromise being on the Saturday. What, the only thing that's really being asked to compromise is the dyke march, and that sort of just mirrors the way that society at large asks women to compromise often. And so having that from our community is pretty hurtful. So that's why we wanted to be here tonight to address that possibility and to say, you know, we're going to fight back if that happens, but we want to be with you. Dyke March is a wonderful model for what we're talking about as a free form, free form, unpermitted if uh, we need to be, but unpermitted, free form, no floats, no, although we did one uh, year have the Magic Wand Marching Band. <laughs> and no barricades either. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Maury. I'm just here as a person, not representing any group. Um, but I did organize the first ever float for the Department of Education two years ago. And that was a big deal for the department. They were very resistant to doing a float. And we very purposely made it a big fuck you to uh, what's her face, Secretary of Education. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know if any of you ever noticed the float, but it was like, you know, a person of color, fist raised, trans flag flying, like it was a real thing and it meant a lot to people. So I wouldn't say eliminate the floats entirely, um, but I'm wondering, because it, it appeared to me during the process that basically anyone that wanted a float could buy one in the parade, so why don't we make it like more of a competitive thing so people have to apply and there has to be some rationale for why they would have a float in, in the march. And you know when we're talking about compromise, like I'm not into floats at all, but if we have to have floats, I think that there could be a process 
to limit the number of floats, which would shorten the march and you know, allow the floats to be more meaningful. Um, I will also say, yeah, absolutely, you cannot step on the dike march. We will fuck you up. Like, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, and then finally, like my personal vision for the march, I would see it like to see it more of a resistance march. Like one thing I love about the Dyke March is it wasn't like a oh boo hoo, we're so afraid you're stepping on us. Like fuck no, we've come a long way. Like it was it was about you know uh, claiming our power as a group and saying like hey, we're not just dykes and we've won this but we're here to support immigrants, to support people of color, support everyone, because we have that power now, and we are going to meet you in that solidarity. And that is the march I would like to see. Hey, um, my name's Paul, and I'm just here as an individual today. So um, yeah, I mean, I want to celebrate and on the 50th, and I also want to acknowledge that we are not going as far as we need to be, particularly for immigrants and, and gay and lesbian and transgender people around the country. So I think figuring out that balance, I don't want to protest. I'm just going to really be honest. I'm, I'm protesting every day. Leslie can, um, you know, Leslie can definitely vouch for that. And um, I think I want to engage people and a lot of people. And I'm just going to be honest. My friends don't want to protest the march. But they have real issues with corporate takeover. They have real issues with a police state that's taking over the march. So I actually think a vast majority of LGBTQ people actually are not particularly happy with the march. But they're not going to protest it. So I would just say two options. Figure out how to do a campaign against HOP or two, do an alternative something. And that's what I'm interested in. I suspect no one wants to spend their time protesting the march. We want to do a march that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Hi, my name is Kareem, um, also with BioQuest. Today, would have, this year would have been my first time protesting, except for the fucking barricades. Um, so my question is more towards the organizers. We have well over 100 people in this room. What would it take, and we've discussed a lot about, um, about working against uh, HOP and uh, organizing independently of them. What would it take for us to seize control of HOP? <laughs> number, number. We have plenty of people here who can get more numbers. We need bigger, we need even bigger than this. <laughs> Hi. Um, so we have not only the this year um, the Pride March to protest against, but also World Pride. So it's the convergence of two things. So Pride, as Heritage of Pride runs it, is despicable for lots of reasons, and World Pride is actually also despicable for lots of reasons. In the places that World Pride has organized, in some cases, as Anne mentioned, for example, in Rome, it was sort of a, like a finger in the eye to the Vatican. But when World Pride was in Jerusalem, it was protested by queers because it was selected, uh, Israel like, competed for it as a way to show that it was a good place for queers, and yet Muslim and Arab and Palestinian queers couldn't go. And in New York, World Pride, if it's here and has the corporate floats, et cetera, will be pinkwashing like Wells Fargo as it funds prisons and the Dakota Access Pipeline, whatever. So on the one hand, we have to, we have our pride, our longstanding pride issue to contend with. On the other hand, we have World Pride. And, and I actually, um, I mean, the two of them together reflect a problem that, that maybe it's worth recognizing on the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, which is that like, it's like queers are cool now, and so we're just used to cover shit up. And so perhaps the theme of a civil rights march could not just be, we want the rights, but also, you can't use us to pinkwash this shit anymore. So we're highlighting that. Hi, I just wanted to tell if, like, younger generation or, um, 
Yeah, I'm also from younger generation, and for the yeah, for the most Americans who born here, it's not a problem. The problem was for these people, Speak but but back. but please realize that for many people, young like me, even younger, still issues of threat to death is still real. So I've been threatened to rap to be raped on Fifth Avenue in Central Park, even in New York. Um, my friends, like trans women, still feel uh, violence. So even if it's not a problem for you, it doesn't mean for young people is everything is good, okay? Um, no, I'm agree with you, of course, we should fight microaggressions, but we still face the same issues as uh, people faced like 50 years ago, okay? So for example, in New York, uh, so many immigrants and immigrants come from their countries and even we as immigrants protected still even from inside communities, outside communities, we feel so much violence. And regarding the corporations, it's important what they have gay rights, but it's for gay cis men. Trans women coming out, getting fired, and I will not celebrate until my trans sisters getting killed still in New York. It's not a celebration if it's we still at such a big threat. Hi, my name is Bill Bowman. I was an uh, early member of the Gay Activists Alliance. My first march was 1972. I helped form GLAD, I helped form uh, the Lavender Hill Mob and ACT UP. Uh, my life has been one of protest. And the Heritage to Pride has kind of bastardized our, our movement. And I totally agree with everything that Mark had to say earlier. I think we need to get the parade back to a march, eliminate all floats, uh, can do some puppeteering or things like that to create more, you know, definitely there should be things that- Halloween that, parade. Yeah, that, that show our creativity and, and get ideas and information across. When I helped organize GLAD's protest in 19, 86 uh, for Heritage uh, for the for the march, we had the Glad Dirty Dozen, which listed 13 people, Baker's dozen, uh, the biggest homophobes that we were fighting at the time, including William F. Buckley and Cardinal O'Connor, and it wasn't just their names on there; it was a paragraph as to why all these people were our enemies. And we, threw, and we threw Hitler in there as well, just to further disgrace the other 12 people that were on the list. <laughs> so I, I totally support pretty much everything that was said here tonight, and we really need uh, to work hard over the next few weeks to make sure that our vision of world pride in New York is the way we want to see it and makes a strong statement because while I heard a couple of people say we have things to celebrate, we have a lot to fight for right now. And, and, and we're, we're in bad shape and we need to fight. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tanya Walker. I'm a transgender and I'm a U.S. Army veteran. And um, I came, you know, when I came out the military, I came to New York in 1986. And uh, a lot of the gay people that were here then are dead from AIDS, you know, and uh, I don't see a lot of them in the room. Anyway, when I came to the village, I was told by a white gay man that, uh, you see that person over there? I have respect for that person. That person is the reason why we're down here in the village uh, near the piers on, on Christopher Street. And it was Marsha P. Johnson. Um, I think that um, Marsha P. Johnson was a black trans woman who was one of the first trans people to get into the Stonewall. And let's keep the focus on the Stonewall. And also Marsha P. Johnson was instrumental in giving you your rights today. And I don't want you to forget that. And I want black trans women and trans women of color uh, leading some of these marches because we are the most marginalized in society. Transgender veterans cannot even serve in the US military because of this guy in the White House. We can't get a job. These Christians are making, want to go to the Supreme Court to make a new law so that we can be discriminated against in employment. Come on. They don't even 
want us to survive. This is genocide. This is genocide. And I want us to have transgender women to have a more active role in the parade. When I came to this parade in 1986, everybody was dying from AIDS. And I want us to have more of an active role. I'm also the co-founder of New York Transgender Advocacy Group. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Gene Fedorko. I'm with the Gay Liberation Front. Uh, in 1969, my boyfriend and I came up from Pennsylvania right after Stonewall, the week after, and we participated in sit-down demonstrations in Sheridan Square. One evening, we were arrested for blocking traffic. Um, and in 1970, we my boyfriend and I participated in the first Pride March up 6th Avenue. We were three abreast, followed by, separated from traffic by a phalanx of police motorcycles. Drivers went by, were like, fuck you, you faggots, you sickos, go back. Yeah, back. And uh, we split up, I guess, I think in Bryant Park, 1971, the year after that. It was the same thing. We marched up 6th Avenue and we split up, maybe we made it to Central Park that year. My memory's getting foggy. Uh, there were no corporations around at that time. They shunned us. They would have nothing to do with us. The only time corporations came on board is when they were required to by law and equal opportunity and anti-bias legislation. Um, 1,100 of my friends, I keep a list, died of AIDS during the crisis. They're still dying. One died last week. Um, somewhere, I, I went underground in terms of activism for a while. Uh, I'm back now. I'm slowly coming back. I'm appalled to see that somewhere in the middle of all of these years of the march, that it's like walking into a dark room. The purpose of the march has been so twisted around, it's like you walk into this perverse dark room and white is black and Hi. black is white, and all of a sudden corporations are co-opting the march, taking credit for hiring people that are LGBTQ as if they were on the scene since day one, and they fucking weren't. They were not at all. And I think we have to keep this as a talking point, that corporations uh, co-opted the march 20 years later, and it's we activists uh, from the uh, 69, 70, 71, there wouldn't even be a fucking march if we didn't put our asses on the line, get arrested. Some of us were killed. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Michaela Griffo. I marched in the first gay pride march. I was very active in the GLF. I agree with everything Jean just said. Um, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at all these young people. You know, where is our anger? Where is our, I don't want to sound like, you know, <laughs> what's his name? But really, we risk our lives for you. The police would not protect us because they were owned by the mafia. The mafia threatened to kill us because it was the lesbians that closed down the mafia bars. We picketed those bars. They would chase us down the street. They came to our dance with guns. They wanted the money. We stood up to them. Mark, thank God I agree with everything you said. We, it's our march. Yeah. It's not the march. <laughs> into like one or two rows. We took over 6th Avenue, and we continued to take over the avenues until this fucking heritage of pride took over our march. Let's take our march back. I don't give a damn what we have to do, where we have to march, but it is our march. And social justice was what we were marching for. Uh, hey, my name is John. Uh, some youth are listening and want to know about the past and know something but want to know more. So we're out there. But uh, also I think it's really important for us to 
remember that as we enjoy progress that we've made, uh, we have to be careful about what's happening coming going forward. Uh, we, we're learning a lot about, about, and everything is new now, but some things are precedented. And African Americans in this country, uh, in, the, in the HOP, uh, like a mission statement, it says that they are doing everything they do so they they can so we can achieve equality under the law. Equality under the law was given to people who are African American and took away directly afterwards, repeatedly, both uh, antebellum and then civil rights era, pre-civil rights era. And uh, you can't forget that whatever you win in the courts can be taken back from you. You have to continue to fight forever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to say is that my vision for this pride coming up next year and going forward is about inclusivity. It's about people that, that, that uh, not being involved because of their, their uh, way of life or their choice of a job. It's about bringing people who haven't been involved, haven't been welcomed, and need to be there because they are, are essential to this community, being all involved. And not in order of uh, the amount of money your corporation makes that you work for. Whether you work, everyone in the city works, and nobody, everyone could be fired for working at a certain point. But, um, so if you work at, at you know, Google, Time. please march. If you work at a bodega, please be able to march. Yeah. It's my Bill Donahue moment. <laughs> the young ones don't get that one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I've been one of the people participating in organizing for Reclaim Pride, and I just wanted to give a little bit of background since people were referencing what our action steps are going to be moving forward in terms of either approaching HOP or organizing our own things. So in terms of the relationship with HOP, some of you may have already heard this before, they held their elections last year to be for the March coordinator for two years, so that even if we do go and flood their meetings this year, it changes nothing, because they have their set person, who was the person who coordinated the terrible march this year. It went out. Uh, the person who coordinated the terrible march this year is also going to be the same person who will be coordinating World Pride and Stonewall 50 for next year. There's nothing to be done about that officer. No matter how many of their meetings we go to, no matter how many of them they cancel at the last minute with us as we've been trying to organize with them. That's another thing they've been doing. So, in terms of our action steps moving forward, I am in full agreement with so many of the things that have been said here, we absolutely need to be putting the focus on inclusivity. Again, we absolutely need to be focused on both it being Stonewall 50 and World Pride, and the fact that there are the people in Chechnya actively dying on a daily basis, having their bones being brought back to their families because of continued prejudice throughout the world. And so we need to have both things in mind at all times. And so I'm going to ask everyone here to make sure that you are doing everything you can to be involved as we go forward. Please come to the Saturday meetings. Please continue to be with us. Please do show up to the hot meetings, even if it's just to give them an earful, because we can't change it now. But we need to make this hurt for them, so that when then we do do our own thing, people understand why. It's not just that we're coming out and doing something because we're being impetulant. My name is Bill Monahan. Um, when I was thinking about uh, this particular year, the 50th year, um, my thoughts were to not only see um, a big celebration in New York, but I, I sort of thought that what we were celebrating is um, our history, meaning our history on the on the planet, and that. Th Gay history is, and lesbian history, and qu queer history in general, is qu quite old. I mean, there are heroes that we never saw in our life because they died in the 19th century, they died in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, and when I thought about what we do on this day, I thought that maybe what we would do is to point out to, uh, to everybody the people who had been there when being there really might have meant just being one person. 
uh, or me, a group of people who will um, have a commune somewhere. I certainly think that there are heroes who are no longer with us who I actually marched with <coughs> in ACT UP, in GAA, uh, and that they should be celebrated. But there are also people who I, I, I don't know. There may be people who are people in Chechnya right now who are really the front line of gay liberation in Chechnya. There certainly were a few queer Irish people who were the uh, front line of gay liberation or queer liberation in Ireland, in Italy, in Germany, in France. These are the people I think of when I think of a protest march that's going to be reflective of what world history is for queers. And that's what I thought we'd see on that day. We'd see a celebration of all of those people who maybe half of the people we might not know, but we'd bring them, and by bringing them, we would reflect the world in New York City, not only celebrating what we did in New York City, but also acknowledging what people had done in the past for us. You know, I hate it when facilitators call on themselves. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I, can I indulge myself with a minute? Yes. Um, 90 I, seconds. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, in, in shorthand, uh, I do have a vision of a big, massive civil rights march for equality and justice for all. And I hope that's what we can accomplish, whether we displace the current version of the march or just hold our own on Sunday in opposition or whatever. Uh, but uh, one thing that uh, concerns me in what I'm hearing tonight, and I agree, of course, with 99% of what everyone said, is there, is there is an emphasis appropriately on the history, but I don't think we're talking enough about the uh, peril that we're all in and people are in all over the world today. Yeah. And to me, that's, uh, you know, I see a march where there are a lot of uh, uh, posters being held up that acknowledge the heroes and heroines of history. I want all of that through all of history. But, you know, one of the most moving things I saw this year was LGBT people who had been who had fled Uganda yes. and were in a refugee camp in Kenya mm -hmm. where they were not allowed to leave. They are imprisoned in a refugee camp in Kenya and they held a pride celebration in the refugee camp in Kenya where they are regularly tortured every day as Ugandan LGBTQ refugees holding up rainbow flags, marching through their refugee camp. And that is the kind of thing that is going on all over the world and that people are facing. And we have an attorney general in this country who has just formed a religious freedom task force to order Justice Department attorneys all over the country to emphasize bringing cases to defend religious freedom for business owners to reject LGBTQ customers or education facilities or whatever. This is an ongoing daily struggle and we need to be in the street protesting. We need to be in the street protesting it right now, but we certainly need to be protesting it on the 50th anniversary of the uprising. And one more thing for 10 seconds. I got a note today from one of the uh, veterans, John O'Brien, who when I mentioned his name to this crowd, they all went, oh my God, uh, who said, yes, big civil rights march on Sunday, and then on Monday, we should be going to all the consulates of all the horrible countries that are torturing people and doing actions at each of those consulates. I thought it was a fabulous idea. Um, first off, I wanted to... Just hold it up. Okay. So, as far as both celebrating where we've come from 
and where we are today protesting, um, including every issues here and in other countries, we can do all of these things. Now, I just wanted to point out that this is the first time that all of us have been in this room. And so when we go back to our sir, now this may sound really obvious, but when we go back to our circles, to our communities within the LGBT community, you know, we need to be asking ourselves who's here, who's not here, <laughs> whose voice is being dominated, whose voice is dominant, whose voice is the default, who isn't even in this room right now. And we can't do, and above all, listening to the people who've been excluded. Because if we can't do that in our smaller circles, we sure can't do it on a larger scale. I just wanted to put in a note of legacy. <laughs> um, people have been talking about celebrating versus protesting. Is it going now? <laughs> people have been talking about protesting versus yeah. celebrating, and I. Is that not working? Yeah. Oh, now it is. Okay, so I'll do it this way. Um, people have been talking about protesting and not celebrating, and I just want to say I don't see a conflict between yeah, those two. Yeah. I believe, as Emma Goldman did, if I can't dance, it's not my revolution. I think, I think that it is extremely important for people to understand that when you are protesting, you are celebrating. Yeah. You are celebrating everyone who came before you, and you are celebrating on the day. And I've never met somebody who left a demonstration and was not high. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing, Maxine. There's a difference between a protest and a queer protest. When we protest, <laughs> We are fabulous, right? And so it's not gonna be this dour marching through the street. We're gonna be fabulous, we're gonna have glitter, we're gonna have drag queens, we're gonna have everything, right? Because when we protest, we have fun. So yeah, let's have a celebration, but let's have a protest at the same time. And let's do it all together. I wanna remind everybody in this room also that the gay pride isn't a one a, a year affair. I, I do remember when we marched because we had no voice. And I marched in every single Pride March except the first one. But for the past 20 years, I've double marched. The, it, as hard as it is with the barricades to go from an early group at the end of the parade to double back and, and march again. But I belong to a lot of organizations. Uh, I'm in this room at least twice a month. At least three times a, a week, I have a meeting to run to, which is a lot cheaper than going to the theater. Um, but and it's not enough. And more entertaining. You meet a much nicer group of people. Um, we have a voice use that voice. It's not enough to just vote. Join your local Democratic club. Get involved with your um, community board. There are, if you go downstairs or pick up the, 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 the leaflet the, of um, the schedule of this building of groups of mar that meet here, there are so many organizations. Find something that interests you and get involved. Um, I, I'm, I'm seeing some faces here that I haven't seen in many years. I know there are a lot of people in this room, um, and, it's, and it's very touching, who, who go way back to the very, very early days of the movement, as I do. Get involved, stay involved. We have a voice, use it. Thank you. My name is Moroggan. Um, first, I wanted to thank all the people here who have been here from the very beginning and have like done so much so that we can be where we are today. I come from a very conservative part of um, California, and so coming here 
and being able to say, hey, I'm not straight, and have people not bat an eyelash to that is fantastic. And being able to meet other queer people and build that community that I have been for the last year and a half. I want to thank you guys for your um, work for making that possible. I, I was in this room uh, prior to the uh, this year's March parade uh, and with Heritage Pride and 15, 20 police officers on the front panel as well. Uh, and all the goals that, no pun intended, that, <laughs> that Heritage of Pride said they wanted to accomplish this year, none of them were a victory. They failed at everything that they said they wanted to do. The, mar the time of the, the length of the march being over nine hours this year. Uh, it was 24 that, minutes shorter. 24 minutes shorter, After exactly. all the bullshit. The, the moving of the street fair uh, to University Place was also a disaster. They, they have failed miserably. The route change? The route, the route, the march to nowhere, exactly, <laughs> was pointless and no one could understand why it was being done and, and it made no sense. Uh, the closing down of uh, the piers uh, left it so nobody could uh, uh, congregate and continue the, the day together in, in celebration and party and whatever you wanted to do. People have, every uh, front stoop in my, I live in the West Village, every front stoop had a big party going on. And it all worked out beautifully. But uh, what Heritage Pride tried to do, they failed miserably. And we need to figure out and work really hard within the next couple of weeks to get ourselves plugged in, involved, and change things radically. And it's not just having a meeting here and then going home and say we did something. We need to stay plugged in uh, through the Facebook page and through the emails that people get and work out our course of action. And I'd love to hear some ideas from people in terms of how we should proceed. Time. Jay, Good timing. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Bridget McGinn. I'm with Gays Against Guns. And um, so we were in the march in the back, you know, waited for hours and did all that bullshit. Um, I was also at the front of the march when it was coming up, at, you know, just arriving at its end and saw the beginning. And I'd like for it to be brought to HOP's attention also how many um, uh, city agencies were there. Like, we're watching sanitation trucks go by and all of that before anyone else. So, you know, Stonewall is, was a riot, and I'm all for, you know, making a stand for our rights because we're, we're going to lose them again. So I just want to make a suggestion that, you know, let's propose to HOP, this is what we want, this is what we, we you know, can we come up with a mission statement, common goals, and we're gonna hold you to them, and if not, put a time limit on it and start planning and let them know we're doing it, and sorry, you know, but do it quickly, like let's just be definitive with them and not, you know, go back and forth too much. Hi, my name is Carol Demich, the timekeeper. I'm gonna make this short. Uh, my friend who was sitting next to me lives in the community. She's straight. She owns a business in the community. Extremely supportive of LGBT people and me, um, being one of the LGBT people. And this is what she wrote. Um, As a community member, the congestion was overwhelming. She lives on uh, 15th Street. I lived on 17th Street. I now live on 57th. But anyway, she writes, I 
don't feel a neighborhood with narrow streets is the right venue. Additionally, the march lost its soul and sold out to corporations. It was hard to tell the difference between this and the Thanksgiving Day Parade. So um, I think this is from a straight person in the community who's supportive of us and wants to have on her sheet a civil rights march because she would be in it. All right, thank you. All right, uh, this is the time that we had on the agenda to uh, move from this uh, group discussion to maybe smaller group discussions and the vote. A vote first? Yeah, we're going to vote pass them in, and during the group discussion, someone's going to tabulate them. So, so okay. Uh, so, uh, yes. Uh, what's the connection between World Pride and HOP? Does anyone need to speak? Uh, World Pride is working with Heritage of Pride to coordinate efforts for next year. They Their, want a bidding yeah. process. Yeah. <laughs> Let me, may I look at the ballot? Yeah. Please, Mark will explain the ballot. Okay, here are your options. You can add your own, all right? Uh, so first of all, replace the hot march, throw it out like they did in LA, and do a civil rights fabulous protest march instead, all right? That's the first one. The second one... Yeah, the online. Well, this is going to be online, too, if you want to vote online instead. Um, secondly, this has been discussed with HOP. We do our civil rights protest march first. It could be 10, 50, 100,000 people. The women's march was half a million people when it happened, right? So that comes first, followed by the corporate march. So that's the second choice. The third one would be what happened uh, in at Stonewall 25, that we have a protest march on the same day. Day, Call the civil rights march. civil rights march on the same day, but but a different a different street than the hop march. The fourth choice is that we hold a protest march on a separate day, not on Saturday, okay, but some other day than uh, uh, than Sunday. Uh, the fifth choice, which was brought up in a meeting, that we just disrupt the hop march. We just show up and we we you know shut. We do our thing, whether they let us or not. Um, and then the sixth one, we wanted to keep it there for those of you who here who are here who like the hop march, uh, that's there, or at the bottom, or write your vision. We thought we'd do this as kind of a, a rank thing, so it, do one for the, for the one you like the best, two for your second choice, three for your third. You don't have to vote for all six. You can vote for one or two or three, or as many as you want, but rank them so we get an idea which uh, is the most popular. And so you can do it here, or you can go online, uh, the website, uh, you, you go to reclaimprideNYC.org to vote, and there should be a link to it there. Is that right? Is there a link if you want to do it online? Or you can do it on the paper and pass it in, and then we're going to do breakout groups, and then while we're breaking out, people will try to get a sense of what the vote is. So vote as often as you want, rank them. Any questions about those? Do they make sense? And you could write your own vision at the bottom if you have a different vision than the ones that we came up with. And if you have not signed in and uh, given us an email address or whatever, please do so that we can keep in touch. And we want to yeah. spread the word and make this bigger and bigger. And bigger. No, this would be the hot part right. would go on. If we sit in line, we would have a separate one. So they, they're marked for separate one. We don't have a we, we can make that happen. We can demand. We're, 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 our vision is demand. demand. One other, one other quick thing, uh, folks, is that um, just in case you don't know, the Reclaim Pride Coalition is meeting weekly here at the LGBT uh, Center, uh, 1.30 every Saturday. Um, we may be shifting that at some point in the future. Right now, we're going to stick with our Saturdays because we've been doing it for this long. Everyone is welcome to join us. Tell your friends. Uh, 
Uh, I hear murmuring. I see people leaving. Don't leave yet. Don't leave. So, well, if you're going to leave, please make sure you've left your contact information at the front desk and your ballot. Uh, so my question is, do we want to have breakout groups or further group discussion about how to proceed? Or do we want to schedule another meeting? Or don't forget, HOP is having its uh, town hall meeting on August 13th, and we should all be there so we can voice our opinion about what we want uh, to collaborate with HOP on a civil rights protest march, perhaps, yes. Ah, uh, yes, we can do that. But everybody come on Saturday here at the center at 1.30. We need all of us to plan, because if we're going to take down HOP, it's going to take a lot of strategy and planning, right? So please come on Saturday to find out how we do this. And if there are folks that are particularly motivated, maybe we're not going to do breakout sessions right now, but we do have some folks that have been working with Reclaim Pride for a while that are going to take the lead in certain areas. So. Um, Direct action. Folks want to, you know, to work on direct action protests that you could do. Go and see Mark right over there. You can see him today. You can walk over there right now. You don't have to listen to me anymore. Um, next one is community outreach. That's going to be Carol, who is our timekeeper. She's right here. If you want to work with Carol on doing community outreach, come talk to her. Um, Huge. There's about 10,000 gay organizations in this town that we've got to reach out to. <laughs> yeah, wherever you want Okay, the next group is media outreach. Okay, Sherry is going to be in charge of media outreach. She was your greeter. She's up there with her hand up in green. If you would like to work in media outreach, if you're someone who's worked in media, if you have media contacts, if you have a list of reporters that you know by their first name and they'll do stuff that you want them to, please go over and see Sherry and you can start the process of sharing that information. Um, next is logistics. So logistics covers a lot of stuff. Logistics is fundraising, it's facilitation, it's scheduling, it's meeting space. Um, you can come see me for that um, if you're interested in helping with that. Um, and then the final group is education and literature, and that's kind of producing all the all of the, the, the handouts, the mailings, the stuff online that we're going to need to educate the public about all of these issues that we've been talking about today. If you would like to help out in that area, you're going to see Colin, who's right over here. Um, and uh, yes? Is there a group for digital marketing? That would be in the media outreach. So if you're interested, yeah, go see Sherry. That would be covered under any other questions about about groups or is there Sherry in the green. Sherry in the green. Sweet, sweet Sherry in the green. Um, any is there anything anyone thinks that we left out in coming up with these committees? Feel free to shout it out. Hi. Is there one for corporate outreach so we can steer the corporations away? <laughs> <laughs> I want to survey the corporations on whether the marchers, and maybe I'm a cynic, the marchers in the pride parade with the corporate t-shirts, were they really LGBT? Exactly. Were they Oh, uh, okay. Uh, hold on. Were they stacking the deck with a bunch of their people? specifically dealing with World Pride, we didn't establish a group to specifically deal with reaching. I would probably fall under outreach, because it would probably be about like really reaching out to whoever the organizers of World Pride are, and, and, and that sort of thing. Just like outreach to other LGBTQ groups, that would be like one big Mondo LGBT group. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. I just want to share one story of a friend, uh, a woman of color with a child who was asked to be on a float, and she goes, but I'm not queer. We don't care. We want a black woman with a child on our float. So that's the kind of thing oh, they're doing. Yeah. Oh, and speaking, and speaking of floats, uh, this year, um, on the, one of the sort of special invited guest floats at the front of the parade, 
uh, and it's a parade. I don't even call it a march anymore, it's a parade. Um, what we're gonna do is gonna be a march. Um, uh, you know, Emma Gonzalez uh, from, from, from Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School what, what, from, from, Parkland, uh, from Parkland, Florida, was on one of the floats and her mother was marching you know, on the ground because you know, her mother with, with other friends and family members of the other people that were on the float with Emma. And at the end of the march, the float went, was forced to go this way. All the people that were marching with the float were forced to go that way. And so Emma and her mother were separated. They literally could not get back together. It's like that's the kind of crap planning, especially for an honored guest that they separate, you know. So, so uh, you know, with a lot of the issues that we've been dealing with with, with the parade that Heritage of Pride was supposedly addressing with all of these changes that they made this year, the fact is it's their crappy organizing in a lot of ways that has something that has to do with it. It's the huge spaces between contingents that start at the very beginning of the, of, of the parade. So well, anyway, I'm not going to talk anymore. What we want to do is concentrate on creating the experience that we want, period. All right, anyone else have anything to say before we uh, adjourn for the evening? Remember that Reclaim Pride meets on Saturday afternoons at 1.30 every Saturday right here at the center, and uh, we'd love to make it uh, bigger and bigger and bigger so that we can start working on this and actually pull off a big civil rights march. Who can come on Saturday at 1.30 to help us plan? We need all of you. Great. Yeah. yeah come on. Come. Let's make it happen. All right. And August 13th at the Hop Town Hall here, which may, we'll send out a note, but it may be 7 o'clock. Marlene? Uh, I, have just have two I, I just have two questions. You said the rent for this space is $400. You said that the rent for this space is $400. Is that $400 for this evening or $400 for all of your meetings? No, no, no. Okay. Two hours. When, all right, okay. When the Lesbian Avengers were here, the center used to always give us a bill. And we would go into the office and we would say, well, we're poor. We're queer. We're dykes. We don't have a lot of money. Corporatized and, now. Yeah, it doesn't matter that it's corporatized now because so is Heritage of Pride, and we're going to change that. I would suggest that whoever's paying the bill walk into the office and say, look, we're a bunch of queer folk. We can't afford $400. That's, for this space, that's outrageous. I'm sorry, it's outrageous. Um, so I don't think that we should take the money that we made tonight and walk in and say, this is what we have. You should negotiate that. And if, uh, maybe you have already, and they lowered it to $400. Yeah, no. But I sort of doubt that. Yeah. I would just say, hey, this is a community space. I was here when the center opened in the 70s. I remember when it opened. I was here. This place looked like shit. And it took, it took many, many millions of dollars to build it up to what it was is now, and it wasn't just corporations that helped to do that. It was built on the blood, sweat, and tears of people from ACT UP, people from Queer Nation, people from the Lesbian Avengers, and every other group that meets here. I think it's outrageous that they would say to you, you gotta pay $400 for two hours. I I, I, that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> Bear in mind, it would have been more if we'd used their sound system. We brought these mics in. That's why there's crap. Because <laughs> we couldn't afford to pay the additional money that it would have cost to get three mics from them. <laughs> no, good point. Point next to you. Yeah, hi. Um, I just want to add um, another point. I was in Rotterdam when they were the World Pride City. It was some time this century, I don't remember what year, but um, my friends and I, the, my Dutch friends and I went to, um, to watch, there were no barricades, but the entire parade was a replica of what Heritage of Pride has become. It was endless floats with half-naked people dancing to very loud music. It was very exciting, but it sure didn't feel like what I expected. And I think we have an opportunity next year to be an example and to send messages to people in countries who can't
do what we can do, that we're here for them, and they can copy us. Can we, can we close yes, with a chant? How about you, Governor? Off the sidewalks into the street, we oh. claim pride. Off the sidewalks into the 